Um, can everybody hear me at the back? Yep, okay, good. <coughs> Seems kind of appropriate that I'm talking about the Clyde Bank Blitz on Armistice Day. Um, uh, I was going to explain myself, but you've done that for me, thank you. Um, you'll notice in all of that introduction there's nothing about history. Um, I had history rammed down my throat as a child, and I had history teachers who couldn't control the class. So I had no love of history and came to it via real people. Um, so, uh, and not dignitaries or battles, but actually what's always interested me is what were, what were the real people up to. So um, this is the result. Um, oops. Um, the interbuttons not working. Is that not how I go for it? Um, maybe just use the arrows. Oh, okay. um, so this is the result. This is Mavis's shoot, which is a story of the Clyde Bank Blitz as seen through the eyes of a young girl. Um, and um, to give you the basics of the Clyde Bank Blitz, it was the worst bombing episode that happened in Scotland during the Second World War. It happened on the 13th and 14th of March, through the nights, um, in 1941. Um, the, the numbers are about, we're not quite sure how many people died because some areas were just completely flattened. But we'll come back to that. The official number of dead is 527, I think, 528, something like that. Um, but one uh, person who had lived through it, when, when he heard that number, when it was leaked, because it shouldn't have been, a year later, um, said, in what street? And from what I've gleaned from the people I've spoken to, um, that's probably a more accurate assessment. Um, in 2003, um, Britain and America invaded Iraq. And shortly after that, most of the uh, independent journalists somehow were magically killed in friendly fire. So all the information we had about what was happening to ordinary Iraqi people was, uh, was not coming through to us here. And I wanted to know. The nearest thing I had to that was the Clyde Bank Blitz. In actual fact, it was quite different, I think. But this, the fundamental feeling of going about your daily life and having bombs coming out of the sky is probably quite universal. Um, I also grew up about three miles from the epicentre of the bombing. Uh, and my mother grew uh, at the time of the bombing was eight miles from the epicentre of the bombing and neither of us knew anything about it. I knew of it, I knew it had happened, but I didn't know anything about it or the details or the scale of it. So it seemed really important to find out. Um, so my, this is where I started. Uh, the Clyde Bank Blitz book is, was written in about the 70s, I think, and it's by a, a local headmaster and historian. Um, and is still really the definitive guide of what happened. It's got all the numbers and places and so on. Um, the Untold Stories book was my absolute starting point because that is that was written by the Clyde Bank Life History Life History Group, I think they're called. Um, yes, Clyde Bank Life Story Group. Sorry, um, and is reminiscences of things during the war. They're not all about the bombing, but a lot of them are. So that was my starting point, because I was trying to, trying to understand the experience of what it's like to live through something like that. Because that, um, that is your, well, I'm a novelist, that's your dramatic tension. So dealing with, with drama of that kind, to put it in a callous sort of way. Um, but I really wanted to understand and write about it. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, so, and also, I had written a really terrible novel before this, which will probably never be published, also about World War II. So I had a lot of the home front stuff, but I didn't have the details about what actually happened on that spot. So therefore, I phoned people up, I found contacts and I phoned people up, and I asked them to speak about what was probably the worst thing that ever happened to them in their entire lives. And I had to say things like, hello, I'm a writer, I said, feeling like a complete fraud, because at that point I wasn't really. Um, it's very delicate, but this is where my background in counselling and psychotherapy helped. Um, I found a woman who was an archivist in, um, for Cal Glasgow Caledonian Special Collections, um, and she had been evacuated to Carbeth, which is where the story moves to, <coughs> the hut community in Carbeth, and she had overheard things. She wasn't in the bombing, but she'd overheard things of, that people said who had lived through it and had escaped over the hills to Carbeth, as many people did. Um, and she could barely tell me what she had heard, not, not what she'd seen, what she'd heard. In fact, she didn't tell me what she did was she'd written it out for somebody five years previously for another researcher, and she handed me the paper like this. Like, she didn't want to have to look at this ever again. 
lift, and that's someone who hadn't even lived through it. Um, I was very lucky at this point because I found a publisher, um, and uh, they uh, sent the book to two people who had actually lived through it. I didn't get in touch with the people in the book because I thought these people have already lived through this, they might not want to actually live through it all over again. Um, but I did find other people who'd lived through similar things or who had, uh, or like the, the lady in uh, Caledonian. So I got very lucky. They published it and sent it to two people who had lived through it. And I was invited to meet this extremely frightening group of people. These are the scariest people I'd ever met. The worst reading, I thought, well, not the worst reading, but the most frightening reading, because these are the people who lived through it. And this is their annual gathering um, that they had roughly around the time of the Blitz um, to, this, to celebrate, or to celebrate, to commemorate, um, and so on. So uh, I was asked to read this. You could have heard a pin drop. It was the most frightening thing in the world, and apparently it was okay, and I had actually caught what their experience had been, but it was very scary. Um, and what I find also is, it's also very moving, because what I find is whenever I do events about this, this incident, um, somebody always comes up, at least one, usually several, with experiences of having lived through it, having, lived through, with, having been brought up with mem other people's memories of it, or having lived through something similar. Um, it sometimes feels like, at that time anyway, it felt like a kind of continuation of my counselling work that still there was a kind of healing thing that was going on here as well. Um, so I've always thought that history is not about battles and so on, it's about the little people, but what ordinary people did to survive, and there are some absolute heroes in that picture with, with astounding stories to tell you. Um, the story moves to Carbeth. This is one of the huts at Carbeth, um, which is a lovely, I don't know if anybody knows about the huts at Carbeth. It's a kind of a, a community of huts that was largely set up after the bombing um, for people who were working in, in industrial areas, particularly Clyde Bank. But another piece of land was given over for more huts for the survivors of the Blitz. I've no idea if that's one, of, one that was built at that time, but this is kind of roughly what they look like. Um, they also have, I think they're now doing, at least one person there is doing their own community heritage project. There's a bit of a battle over who's taking control of this, oh, there was the last time I spoke to them, but fine if they do two part projects, that seems like a good thing. Um, but um, I was lucky enough to meet that lovely group of people who frightened the life out of me again, because I was then asked to be a facilitator for the Blitz Remembered uh, um, commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the Clyde Bank Blitz, which was last year, beginning of as March last year. Um, and the powers that be that were organising this were kind of thinking, well, we have to do something with this because we have to kind of mark it because it's the 75th, but nobody's going to turn up. So um, we set up an afternoon group and an evening group to gather ideas to start off. We had, I think we had something like 80 people came that day at least 80 people, um, that's off the top of my head, because I think there was about 50, 60 in the afternoon one. But anyway, lots and lots of people came. We, um, the group got, the, the, as we then met for, I think, 12 weeks, uh, and in those weeks we never had less than 16 people. We often had more than 30, so we had four giant tables with, with rings of people around about and bringing their ideas. Um, really quite staggering. In fact, halfway through, the poor um, heritage workers in Clyde Bank Heritage Centre got in a complete tiz and said that we're, we've got too many, we have to cut this back, we have to like close the group. I said, you can't close the group, this is a community group, you can't close a community group, that's ridiculous. So they went, right, okay, fine, fine, but you know, but really, this is just too much. Um, and to be fair, my job was to facilitate this, not to curate any exhibitions. So I was kind of, the more I did, the more I was making their job kind of grow arms and legs. So, um, but it wasn't just for an exhibition. It certainly wasn't in my mind. It was to raise awareness of something that people across Scotland don't actually know about. To raise awareness in the local town, obviously. To celebrate some of the heroes of that. <coughs> to commemorate, to think back of it. And also to create 
connections between people to keep it all going. So we, it had um, there was an ex there was an exhibition, but there were various parts to the whole thing really. Um, oh, wrong thing, that one. Um, this is the ship. At, I'm not sure what the one at the bottom is, but the one at the top is the Piorun. Um, which is a model is a model of the Puran ship, which was a Polish warship that was built in Clydebank, was in in um, Clydebank uh, being repaired on the two nights of the Blitz, which is just as well for us because their guns protected Clydebank in ways that we just didn't have enough guns or enough ammunition. Um, so Paul, that's why there's a, a solidarity plaza in the middle of Clydebank to celebrate that connection. Um, and that was brought out and repaired and various other artefacts <coughs> brought in by descendants of some of the men who served in that ship and who came back um, because they felt connected to the place. Um, this, while we're on textiles and so on, this is a beautiful banner. <coughs> it's about, I think it's probably twice as big as that. And it was made by the Banner Girls, who are a local uh, needlecraft group. I think there's only about four of them in this, and they did this in an incredibly <coughs> short space of time. And it just commemorates different aspects um, of the Blitz. Um, we, had, we had a regular fortnightly slot on local radio, on your radio, um, uh, trying to get more people interested and more people involved. See how I drove these Hepfer Heritage guys insane? <laughs> Um, they also did a very special, and I mean special in all senses of the word, programme that went out three times over the weekend of the an actual anniversary, um, where they had discussions with a, small, a smaller number of the survivors of the Blitz, sharing their memories and what had happened to them. We were on STV Glasgow a couple of times. There was a local choir who wrote a special piece of music and a local band called Cousin Halifax, I don't know what the name means, who, um, who uh, wrote a special song which they performed at our opening. Uh, we did walking tours, but the walking tours as people, obviously the people who lived through this are now in their 80s and 90s, so the walking tour eventually um, kind of became became a bus tour <laughs> because otherwise people wouldn't have got round. Um, we uh, we took oral histories obviously, but there have been a lot of kind of waves of oral histories taken over the various um, like the I think the fiftieth there was a lot, the sixtieth, the seventieth, and now the seventy fifth. But it was just incredible that we still had more oral, oral histories to gather. Um, Somebody took on the, uh, um, the German volunteers who, after the war, came back and, and helped build faithfully, and particularly the community centre, and I think also the church. There's certainly there's a, a stained glass window in the church commemorating their presence there um, because they were there to um, not repatriate, what's the word, I can't think of the words, to make amends, whatever. Um, and some of those people actually stayed and married local people. Um, there were school visits in which kids were invited to um, imagine what it would have been like for them if they'd been there. Um, <clears throat> we had a lovely school project around Syria and um, doing lovely white paper doves which were hung in the exhibition room um, that were made by the kids. Um, if you've ever seen any of the photographs um, of of uh, that are I mean obviously there's very few of the Clydebank Blitz. Um, this was put together by an artist and photographer called Owen McGuigan, um, and he there are, you, you kind of have to know the photographs, but basically these are the photographs all turned into a new work of art. Um, I have to say to give you a sense of the scale of this, um, the orange glow that was a, that, uh, that was above Clydebank could be seen in Aberdeenshire. And the sound of the bombs that fell could be heard in Long Forgan, which is 10 kilometres this side of Dundee. So that's how huge this is. My mother remembers the glow because she was in Killern at the time, but she had no idea. She was a kid, so she had no idea what was going on. But that's how big it is. Um, we also we had various other artworks. Uh, that obviously formed the basis for the poster that you saw. We had various other artworks 
um, as well. There was a debate in the, Houses, in the House of Commons for the first time ever about the Clyde Bank Blitz, and there was also a special service held that night. Um, and I think possibly my favourite part of the project um, began here on, this is Facebook, call yourself a banky page. Bankies are what Clyde Bank people call themselves. <laughs> Um, we, put, um, we put a request up on this and also on our dedicated page, which was this, which was, where did you or your family go after the Clyde Bank Blitz? And within two days, I printed out 25 pages of very small print of the responses that we had to that. So this, the response was massive. Some of these responses were from people who were overseas as well. Um, and I think that, for me, that was just one of the, the loveliest things, the bringing together of such a wide community. Uh, during the exhibition, we had two maps up, and people were invited to stick a pin in where, they had, where their families had gone. And, of course, some of the families were still moving around seven years later. There was a friend, uh, one of the guys who... His mother was pregnant at the time. They had, she had three sons, and that family of six moved... Uh, moved to different people's houses for seven years and lived in one room in each of those houses for seven years. And that's, that was the aftermath that nobody ever, as one of the survivors said, that part was actually, that was hell, the bombing was hell, but that was really hell, living like that for years afterwards. There should really be a map of the world because a lot of people left the country and never came back. But what's actually most staggering is the number of people who did eventually come back. Um... Right, and one of <coughs> this is possibly one of my absolute favourite moments was this one. Um, one of the ladies in the group was taken into this basement um, during our time together, and she she had been in that basement for her protection during the Blitz, and she took a photograph while she was down there, and she had obviously a great flood of memories while she was doing this, and she then brought this photograph to the group, and one of the guys on the other side of the table said. I was there too. So the pair of them had actually, all these years later, been living in the same town, hadn't actually seen each other, and here they were coming together, having possibly spent the night playing in this awful basement. So that was, it's the bringing together. The Untold Stories book had people getting in touch from around the world to say that had found, come across the book. Um, so it's that lovely bringing back together of, of people. Um, right, I'm going to go back. We go back. Oh yes, right. So this gives you a kind of flavour of it. There was there was a lot of these panels that you see in the back there. The uniform is a is was found in the attic of one of the guys whose father was on the Pioran. So that's one of the original uniforms. Um, that one of the sadly I wasn't the curator. I would like to have been the curator as well because I really believe in the power of small objects to um, uh, to bring to put history across. <clears throat> I was, uh, I think it was last year as well, I went to Albania and I went to the the, the history museum, the National History Museum in Albania to the, the communist room that, that celebrated the lives of the people who had lived through that era and who had been in prison camps and had died in prison camps or had died for the cause kind of thing. And it was all told through artefacts. For instance, a pair of trousers that was mostly patch, belonging to Michael somebody or other who died at the age of 22 in such and such a prison camp. A broken violin, it's a, it's a corny image, but it was a very real one on this occasion. So, but we couldn't afford any more uh, display cases. So most of it had to be done with photographs and not enough display cases to my mind. Um, there are, this table here, we had two books out. One of them was for people's comments about how they'd experienced the exhibition. I think there was one negative comment with some, from someone who was annoyed because she hadn't been allowed to go on STV, um, <laughs> something like that. Um, and, but the rest of them, I think moving was the word that, um, that kept coming up. The other book was um, an invitation for people to write their their, memoir, their memories of living through the Blitz, and of course that got filled up and filled up and filled up. So, um, so we were still collecting right to the very end. Um, nearly done. Um, uh, nope, done that one. Uh, this is just an example of one of the. You might recognise. Oh, 
her in the, um, the artwork that I was showing you that Owen McGuigan did. Um, uh, there were various other things that we didn't do. I spent a bit of time looking at the decoy sites. You know, we put fake towns around the place and set fire to them when the bombs came to, to draw the, the Germans to bomb that place and not the towns. And these worked fantastically well. And they're, they're not very well recorded. So I would really like to have, to have somebody taken that on. So somebody did take it on, but unfortunately... These people are all getting a bit elderly, and the, there's, there was no way that she was going to make it up the hill to go and see that. So I took some pictures of that, but we didn't actually include it because it wasn't done by the group, and it was a community group. Um, and the other thing was, um, this is the coming back to the figures. <clears throat> this is the report that was done, as you can see on the top, <clears throat> at six o'clock on the 18th of March, 1941, two days after the second night. Um, clearly the, uh, the place had not been cleared they were still pulling bodies out um, there were parts of Clyde Bank they had no idea how many people were there how many dead there were they threw lime in and covered and concreted over there are several places around Clyde Bank to this day sadly the person who knows about that came to the group once and then went away again because it would be quite nice to have documented that but you can see here um, that in that document they said that there were 637 killed. Um, that, that as an official number actually went down instead of up for some reason. Um, but they're saying to which must probably be added about 200 representing the total of the first raid on Clyde Bank. Uh, Clyde Bank was bombed again I think about two months later so I don't know whether that's what, that, well I can't be referring to that because it was written then, I don't know. Anyway, um, quite clearly these figures are not accurate. And it's been a very sensitive point over the years about whether that's important or not and, and the feeling that Clyde Bank lived through something horrendous and nobody knows about it, nobody sees it even in the figures. Um, and I raised this a few times. I raised it with the MP who said he would raise it in Parliament, which he didn't. And I realised that actually one of the things that maybe had happened through this group was... Um, that that need was gone, that that was put to rest, that nobody actually wanted to look at that. It, there was enough that it had been commemorated in the way that it was being commemorated. Um, and I think the final thing I was going to say was about my book, which I didn't realise at the time. <clears throat> I called it Mavis's Shoe because Mavis is a little girl who has who goes missing. At the, just before the bombing starts, she's run off somewhere and gone missing. And the only thing that her sister who's the narrator of the story, has, is a shoe that she finds in the street and thinks might possibly be Mavis's. So she keeps it and she sticks it in her pocket and rubs it like a kind of genie whenever, you know, whenever she gets, she thinks about her sister, she kind of rubs it and thinks, God, where is she? I wish, she, wish we could find her. Um, but it's also, it's interesting because, um, because as I say, I think objects are really, really, really important for telling whole stories. There's something about the physicality of having things to look at or hold um, that help us remember things. And that is that is me finished. And that's the. <laughs>